All right, welcome to a new weekly class. Many of you also attend Mondays, our weekly text-based Tanya. Many of you are watching online and watch the weekly text-based Tanya and recognize the train in the background. That is the iconic train at the Levi Yitzchok Library in Cedarhurst. And this is the location where we have this class. This is not Monday text-based, Tanya. This is something different. What is this? We're going to study different Maimodim, Hasidic discourses. Also text-based, but um, it's not like Tanya where it's been taking us years to get through it. These are, these are shorter texts, and we'll send out the PDF to those who are in the group. We'll send out a PDF beforehand so that you have the text, and it'll probably take us three, four weeks, depending on the length of the particular discourse we're studying, to get through that discourse. Um, also, because it's not as long, the material is not as long, I'll probably be able to allow a little bit more side conversations. In Tanya, I'm sort of a taskmaster. I say, let's stay on point, because I'm trying to finish, you know, it's been two years and we're not finished yet. So with Tanya, I'm sort of trying to keep us moving. With these texts, they're smaller, so I think we have a little bit more wiggle room to get into side conversations. Also, the goal is that I do want these, these texts to be a jumping off point to gain some literacy in Jewish mysticism. So when we encounter different ideas, if there's a discussion that ensues, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna cut that off so quickly. Okay? If it gets really crazy and out of hand, then <laughs> I'll let you know. But um, I think this could be a little bit more laid back than Tanya, <laughs> where we're we're pushing to finish. Okay, make sense? Yeah. All right. So this first discourse that I've chosen. Uh, why did I choose it? First of all, it's a classic, but also because this week is Parshas Noyach, the second. Torah portion of the, the new year. And this discourse was said in the week, or just following the week, of Parshas Noyach. And it's related to the theme of Parshas Noyach. Noyach, of course, is the Torah portion of the flood. And this discourse is about not the flood, but a flood that we all encounter at some point or at more than one point. And it starts, I should give you a little bit of history, by the way. <clears throat> the Mimer, interestingly enough, was not recited at a Fabrengen, which is normally where a Rebbe will say a Mimer, a Hasidic discourse, at a Fabrengen, at a gathering. This was said in the Rebbe's private room and was recorded and transmitted on a speaker system. On um, Shmini Atzeres, of that year, Tavshin Lamed Ches, meaning the f last few months of 1977, the Rebbe had a massive heart attack during Hakafas, during the dancing. And they turned his room into a, a hospital room, and that is where he was treated by doctors, and that's where he recovered. And in order to continue to lift the spirits of the Chassidim, yeah, the Rebbe was the one recovering from a massive heart attack, you'd think people would lift his spirits, but that's the Rebbe. The Rebbe lifts his, his spirits by lifting other people's spirits. So he wanted to continue to teach. Um, so what they did is they set up a, uh, like a PA system where the Rebbe could teach from his room. And this was one of the Saturday night addresses. Basically, after Shabbos, the Rebbe would speak on a speaker system from his room. And this was Parshas Noyach. So you remember how long ago Shemini Atzeres was? What was it? Two weeks ago. So this was like two weeks after the heart attack. And this was the, the Motzi Shabbos, the Saturday night uh, live discourse from the Rebbe's room. Okay? And the Mimer starts as all my modem start. Or I shouldn't say all my modem. Um, the Mimer starts with a a verse, not all my modern start with a verse, most do, okay? And the verse is, Mayim rabim loy yuchlu lechabes es ho'ava 
Onahares Loi Yishtafuha. That is a verse from Shir Hashirim, Song of Songs by Solomon. I'll translate it. Abundant waters cannot extinguish the love, nor can rivers wash it away. What is this verse? You know, Song of Songs of Solomon is a love poem. It's a love poem about the intimate relationship between the Jewish people and Hashem. And it's written in the guise of two lovers, but that is a metaphor or a parable. So the waters, the abundant waters, cannot wash away the love. Meaning the love that we have for Hashem will not be extinguished. They're like fires, fiery, passionate love. They will not be extinguished by the waters. Okay, what are these waters that would extinguish the love, or you would think they might extinguish the love, and we're being told, no, but don't worry, the, 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 the love of Hashem is so fiery and passionate, even the mighty waters will not wash it away. What are these mighty waters? Okay. It is brought in the discourses of the Rebbeim. That means the previous Chabad Rebbeim. I should explain to you that the Rebbe's style is very much an analysis and study of six previous generations of Rebbe's teachings. So when you learn the Rebbe's Maimarim, you get a nice overview of all of the Chabad teachings from the Alter Rebbe on down. The Alter Rebbe and the Mitla Rebbe and the Tzamech Tzedek, and the Rebbe Marash, the Rebbe Rashab, Friedrich Rebbe, it's all included there. So the Rebbe says, it is brought in the Maimodim, in the, in the discourses of his predecessors, meaning this is not the Rebbe's a, a, a novel idea. The Rebbe will present some novel ideas, but at this point, this is stuff that anyone who's a student of Chabad Siddhis would be familiar with. Shemayim Rabim Haim Kol Tir Dais Hapar Nosa. That the abundant waters are the worries about making a livelihood. The abundant waters are the worries about making a livelihood. So, in other words, we worry about not being able to pay the bills, and that preoccupation with our financial stability could threaten and often does pose a threat to our love of Hashem, but we're being assured here in this verse that no, it will not threaten our love for Hashem. It will not diminish our love for Hashem. And that's really what the Mimer is talking about. It's talking about how does our preoccupation with our worldly affairs and even our worries and anxiety about our worldly affairs, how does that interact with our love of God? And what the Mime is going to tell us is that, I'm, without ruining it for you, this is not a bug, it's a feature. The fact that we were taken from heaven, our souls were taken from heaven, and put down here in bodies, and given physical needs, meaning we were put in a position where we have physical needs. That's not a bug, it's a feature. And that the fact that we need to worry about our material security down here, not only will it not <coughs> diminish our love for Hashem, but, and this is what the Mimer is going to explain, it can actually amplify our love of Hashem. And thoughts about the material world. In other words, it's not just financial stuff, but all, ma all material stuff. Vim kolzad, nevertheless, la yuchlu lechabes esoava hamesuteris. These waters cannot extinguish the ava mesuteris. Tanya students, ava mesuteris is a familiar uh, phrase, right? What does Ava Mesuteris mean? The Literal translation? Love. The yeah. hidden love? It's an inheritance from yeah. Hashem. The inheritance. Where does it go? We inherited it from whom? The Aves. The Aves. Yeah. Very good. From Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. 
sheyesh b'chol nefesh mi'yisrael, which is in every Jewish soul. In other words, there are different types of love and different sources for love. Sometimes, like we're learning in Tanya right now, happens to be, we meditate our way into generating new love for Hashem. But this isn't that. This is the innate love. This is part of the operating system. This is part of the, the default operating system. It's already pre-installed. It's part of your neshama. It's uh, instinctive. So the Jewish soul has an instinctive love of Hashem. And of course, it possesses that essentially, meaning it, that's part of what it is. It loves Hashem. And then it comes down into the physical world, and it's embodied. And you might think that the conditions of embodiment and the circumstances of embodiment would cause the Jew not to be able to access his or her instinctive love of Hashem. What the verse here in Song of Songs is telling us, that is not the case. That the worries about our financial security are not going to extinguish or diminish our innate, instinctive, natural love of Hashem. Nor can rivers wash it away, as the verse says. That even when these thoughts are extremely unsettling, they're incessant, constant, meaning you don't get a break from these thoughts. He's not saying that won't happen. It could happen. It could very well happen that you'll be in a situation where you are constantly beset with these thoughts of financial insecurity. Which is precisely why it's metaphorically described as a river, because a river is constantly gushing and flowing. A river is constantly going. So these thoughts, imagine them, visualize. It's like a river. It's, it just won't let up. They are gushing and streaming with a powerful current. Nevertheless, lo yishtavua, lo ava, it will not wash away the love and it will not extinguish it. Okay. <coughs> so as I told you, this is not the Rebbe's original thought. Obviously the verse is from Shir Hashirim, from Song of Songs. The explanation of the verse originally is in Taira Ayr. Taira Ayr is a Sefer of my modem of the Alter Rebbe for my Tanya students. How is Taita Ayr and Lakutai Taita for that matter different than Tanya? So, well, that, that's, that's one big difference. It's a practi- Tanya's a practical guidebook, a manual. And the Maimodim are sometimes explorations of deeper ideas. It doesn't necessarily have the practical application included in it. But also, another difference is just the way that it came to be. The Tanya, the, the Al Tareba sat down and wrote it over a period of many years and was extremely exact with every word. Sometimes it's called Teir Shebech Sav of Chassidus, the written Torah of Chassidus. Teir uh, Oyer and Lukutei Teir are my modem that the Alter Rebbe himself delivered, meaning just like we were describing the Rebbe delivering a, an oral address, so the Alter Rebbe would say my modem. So Teir Oyer and Lukutei Teir are my modem, are, are oral addresses that the, the Alter Rebbe delivered and were transcribed. And obviously there were no recordings back then, so everything was done purely with memorization and then transcribed and then edited. And specifically in the case of Taita Ar and Lakutai Taita, the final edits were done by the Al Tarebbe's grandson, the Tzemach Tzedek, who even included uh, some notes in Lakutai Taita and Taita Ar. Okay. So at any rate, the point is this concept 
that the raging waters described in Shir Hashirim are the worries about our material security. Not putting out the fire means that it doesn't diminish the love, the innate love the soul has for God. That concept comes from as far back as the Alter Rebbe and was, and was re-articulated in various discourses of the previous Rebbe. Okay, yeah. Yeah. However, my bigger thought is, do you love me? And if you do, how? Is it possible? So my concern is not so much, do I love my dad? Mm-hmm. I have the opposite question. <sighs> okay. It's a valid point. For those who didn't hear, the question was, all right, so this mimer is promising me that I won't lose my love of Hashem. But I'm not actually worried about that. I'm worried about if I've lost Hashem's love. That's more of my uh, concern here. So I have two answers for you. One is maybe that's the subject of a different mimer. Maybe that won't be addressed here. Second answer is Maybe sometimes when there's a relationship that's dysfunctional or it's starting to fall apart and we feel that we're unloved or we question if we're loved or we question if we're appreciated and we don't like how we're being treated. Sometimes when we pause and look more deeply, we find out that maybe some of the things we're picking up on are a reflection of what we've been putting out. So it's possible, possible, I'm just saying it's possible, that you may discover that your path to remedying what you perceive as a lack of love of Hashem to you may be accessible through cultivating your love or magnifying your love of Him. Yeah. And spend quality time. When so I would suggest to you then, if you're, you're mentioning the parent-child relationship, I would suggest to you then that that's perhaps precisely why King Solomon is using the metaphor of marriage, because we're talking about that type of relationship. So don't think about it as, why does my tati neglect me? Think about it like, my spouse and I are in a committed relationship and I'm not feeling the love and perhaps perhaps it's because I'm not being loved or perhaps it's because I'm not loving or perhaps a little bit of both and if I can learn how to tap into my love of my spouse maybe I'll come to feel more loved maybe maybe yeah Our whole interpretation of Hashem is that He is our Father and not our spouse? That's not, a, that's not true. First of all, never make a categorical statement. Categorical statements are always wrong. <laughs> Thank you for getting that joke. Okay, that itself was a categorical statement. Don't say our whole relationship with Hashem. No, that's not true. There are different contexts. There are, no, that, no, there are different contexts. Sometimes He's our Father, sometimes, sometimes He's our King. In this case, we're talking about Him as our, as our spouse. Our husband. There are different contexts. And we use the context that's most helpful. Remember, Hashem is infinite. He's not limited to any of these descriptions. These descriptions are for our sake to help us in particular contexts. So the helpful context, the way that Shlema Melech, King Solomon, is contextualizing this aspect of the relationship is that of husband and wife. So that's going to be the helpful paradigm. Okay. My other question was that, that the, the mimer is describing this instinctive and natural love. Mm-hmm. But instinct and, nat- and nature seem easier to access even in troubling times. It's our instinct, right? Like 
my instinct, I could be super stressed out, but my instinct is directing me, telling me. How right. When it, com- when it comes to our love to Hashem, sometimes it doesn't feel instinctual or natural in those anxious... Yeah, but that's precisely the point, that it is instinctive and natural, and therefore, at worst, we've lost touch with it. But it's never gone. And it's always there. And it's not something we have to learn. It's something we have to return to. So this is part of the message here. Is that we're talking about something that should be, I don't want to call it easy, because it's not easy, it's hard work, but simple to fix. Because we're not asking you to become something. We're asking you to tap into, to tap into something that's there. And maybe you lost access to it, but if that's all it is. You lost access. It doesn't feel like it, though. Yeah, it doesn't feel like it. You're right. That's because we lost access to it. But it's still there. <laughs> Sometimes... Uh, Isn't it why it's called the Voida? It's why it's called the Voida, because it's, it's work. Voida, yeah. It's work. Yeah, even tapping into something that's already there is called work. What were you going to say? I'm confused about the two categories of this. There's those who don't struggle for livelihood and maybe don't relate to this stream of anxiety. And then there are those who are trying to eat and trying to give their kids food. And if they don't think about their livelihood, then their kids starve to death. Okay, I think, So the yeah. connection of love to Hashem, to me, like it's not relating to dot to dot. Okay, so let's break it down here. First of all, when you're saying there are people who are wealthy and don't think about money and people who are poor and they're thinking about it all the time, it's actually not true. Not an extreme. I'm just saying a lot of people are not struggling with anxiety over livelihood. Right, but that's not because of how much money they have. People who are not experiencing anxiety over finances is not, has actually zero correlation to how much money they have. Zero? Zero. Right. Zero. And I think if people, people think could afford their bills, there's definitely some relief of... <sighs> you would think. <laughs> you would think, yeah. No, there's zero correlation between how much money somebody has and how much they worry about money. In fact, some of the people who worry the most about it are the people who have the most of it. Um, but that wasn't your main point. Your, I think your main point was, I think you were responding sort of from an emotional place... And you were saying, well, what if there's somebody who is worried they can't feed their family? I think this is what I picked up from your question. It was more like somebody can't pay their bills and they can't feed their family. Why are you categorizing their worries as a lack of love of God? Well, it's very simple. Because any preoccupation, whether it's about money or anything else, that takes your mind it pulls your focus, is going to diminish your ability to focus on God. So that's what we're saying. We're saying a person would like to sit and learn more Torah or to pray at length, and they just can't calm down and do it because they're thinking about the bills. So it's not a judgment. See, here's the thing. You've got to understand something. This is not a judgment. It's not a judgment. If somebody comes to the doctor and says, it hurts when I walk, it's not a judgment, it's a, it's, a, it's a fact. We're not saying, oh, you wicked person, why is it hurting you when you walk? So when somebody says, I'm so preoccupied with money, I can't think about God. It's not a judgment, it's, it's just a fact. The person will say, this, this is the situation right now. So we're not putting the person down by saying that's their their situation. We're describing, we're describing the facts. I can't focus. I can't focus. I can't, I can't meditate. Forget about meditating. I, I, I can't relax and just be besimcha and, and tap into my emun and betachen. I'm just in survival mode and my brain is, is focused on that. So that's what we're talking about. We're talking about somebody who is concerned that because of the fact that they're in a, in a physical world with physical needs, they're not really able to tap into their spirituality. And what we're telling them is, don't worry. 
being embodied and being in a physical world is not going to diminish your spirituality. If you will listen and let us explain, you will come to see how it will actually enhance your spirituality. Not automatically. It has to be understood. Does this make sense, what I'm saying here? Sounds really good. Sounds good? Yeah. How are we doing on time? Got a little time still. Okay, let's continue here. We're on chapter two. First chapter is a short chapter. Okay. Ubi or dio kaloshin tir de saparnosa. Now that Ebba starts to analyze the exact wording, the language that the Alter Rebbe used. He used the word tirdois haparnosa, preoccupation or anxiety about a livelihood. Hinexiv, it says, Yegia kapecha kiseichel daimet. It's a verse from Tehillim, from Psalms. When you eat of the toil or the labor, the work of your hands. You eat from the work of your hands. V'yedua diuk bazeh, and it's known, meaning this is something that's said in many places, that the reason that the wording there in the, that chapter of Psalms is the work of your hands means, as he's about to explain, the work of your hands, not the work of your mind and heart. That when you're earning a living, you should invest your hands, not your mind and heart. Now, what does that mean? Do you do your work mindlessly? No, it doesn't mean that. But hands means your extraneous uh, capacities. And mind and heart means your internal capacities. That when you're making a living, you shouldn't put your deepest self into it. There should be something you do superficially. Meaning to say, don't take it home with you. Don't identify with it. Don't make it your, your identity and who you are and don't make it where you receive your validation and your meaning in life and your purpose in life. Do it because it, it's a means to an end. You have to make a living. Okay, so make a living. The Galatia story is good. <laughs> you want to request stories here? Yeah, yeah? okay. Why not? No problem. Okay. Request for the Galasha story. There was a chassid who spent the Shabbos in Lubavitch by the Rebbe de Shab, and he owned a Galasha's manufacturing factory. And because he was the factory owner, he was worried about the factory, and he would think about it. And uh, even on Shabbos, he was preoccupied with what's going to happen on Sunday at the business. So after Shabbos, the Rebbe Shab said to him, you know, it's very funny, I've seen many people with their feet in their galoshes. This is the first time I've met somebody with his head in his galoshes. Yeah, so you put your hand, put your hands into your work, don't put your head and your heart into your work. <laughs> Even though we know that one's livelihood in this world comes through natural means. In other words, you can't just sit on the couch and say, God, make my livelihood materialize miraculously in front of me. We know that it has to go through natural channels, and therefore there has to be some hishtadlus, some normal effort. We call it making a vessel. There has to be some type of physical action that can receive the blessing. Like the verse says, Hashem will bless you in everything that you do. Everything that you do. In other words, of course, the source of the livelihood is Hashem's blessing. But what you receive it through, or what you draw it down with, is your action. So you have to do something. Your doing doesn't generate the livelihood, but your doing creates a natural vessel within which to receive that livelihood. So you have to do something. So we know you have to do something, but then you, you can't get carried away either. Yeah, do something, 
but it should be yagia kapecha. It should be your extraneous capacities. Don't get so deep into it. And what the Shah Habitachan says, it's so relevant in this case, is that, yes, you're, if you want to make a certain amount of money, you decide which career is going to give you that money and pursue that career. You're right. But yep. at that point, you know, you don't invest all your energy and thought and mind into it because the, it's all a, a funnel from Hashem. Right. It's just, uh, it's just uh, a pipeline. Right. Because Hashem wants what we call a deniable plausibility. He wants an alibi. He wants to say it wasn't a, mir a miracle that you received your livelihood. So he needs you to provide a, uh, an alibi for him, which is doing something that could naturally explain how your livelihood came to you. But um, you shouldn't get carried away with it. Just providing Hashem deniable plausibility. So he can give you your livelihood without us identifying it as a miracle. So don't get carried away. Yeah, we said that. The Ashla Pomim. Now, be, now, sometimes indeed, granted, there will be yagia. It says yagia kapacha, the toil of your hands. Toil means hard work. It could be that you will have to work hard. We're not telling you you're not going to have to work hard. But even when you work hard, it should be yagia kapacha. It should be the toil of your hands. And again, I don't mean we have to be all manual laborers. We don't have to all be ditch diggers. But I'm saying hand symbolizes your more extraneous capacities. Don't put your deep thoughts and emotions into your means for making a living. So we only invest our extraneous capacities. Do not invest your inner capacities, your more lofty capacities that are in the mind and heart. You know why? Because to put your mind and heart into your living is misappropriation. You are given a mind and a heart. You're not an animal. You're a human. You are given the capacity to think deeply and to feel deeply in a uniquely human way. Why were you given that capacity? For one reason. To direct it toward your relationship with Hashem. And in fact, that is the purpose for which you were created. So to take that capacity or those capacities of mind and heart and to apply them to anything else is misappropriation. It already has a purpose for which it was designed. Yeah. And it sounds like teaching says that in Hatsayk and Moshe and a lot of You're saying if your job is teaching? So, do you get paid to teach, or do you get paid to submit lesson plans to the administration? I tell people when I speak, I don't get paid to speak. I love speaking. I get paid to sit on a plane. But that's the part of it that's kapecha. The part of it that's kapecha, right, is booking the gig and getting the plane tickets and getting to JFK and making the flight. If I wanted to, I could get really, really deeply connected to all that stuff. And I could spend a lot of time with that silly stuff. And I have to remember to keep a distance from it. But if you're talking about the part of your job that's actually not a job, it's actually itself part of your service of your creator, yeah, that put your, put your whole soul into. Sure. There are different aspects of a job. But some people have jobs where, you know, they are ditch diggers. So... What do you want them to do? Well, they would dig the ditch and then they, uh, they don't put themselves deeply into it. Maybe even while they're ditch digging, they're thinking about God. But it uh, depends on the type of job that you have. Some of us have jobs that are very interwoven with our Avedis Hashem. 
some people are not so lucky and they have a job and the way that they make it holy is after they're finished working they take that money and spend it on holy things like giving tzedakah and giving their children a Jewish education and so on and so forth. The point is that the, the, the mundane aspect of your job, whatever proportion of your job is mundane, don't get so deeply invested in it emotionally or, or mentally. That's the point. And is this idea something we should generalize to everything in our life? Yes, yes. Now, we're talking here specifically about making a living, but it could be other mundane things. Sure. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Eight, nine hours a day, you're supposed to like compartmentalize these mundane activities right. and not be busy <laughs> in a spiritual mindset. And then you go home and like for a couple hours after work. Right. So 90% of that. your day, you're in like <laughs> autopilot, just coasting through the mundane stuff. But it's also, be, but it's also spiritual. You have to be ethically, you have to treat your co-workers with respect to all. You're all concerning Hashem that way. In fact, that's the most important way. Even the ditch digger has to be nice to the animals living in the burrows and be nice to his fellow ditch diggers. So let let me get more (laughs) specific about what we're talking about. Tir de Saparnosa doesn't so much mean focusing on the task that you do in order to make money. It's more about, when we speak about your mental and emotional investment, what we really mean is not the task, meaning when you do something, do it well, whatever it is. If you, if you dig ditches or you, you, you stock a warehouse, whatever you do, do it well, pay attention to it, do it well. What we're talking about is the preoccupation. So while you're doing the job, what's on your mind? Oh, I got four more hours, and how much am I getting paid per hour? And then the end, and that's going to be this amount of money, and then they're going to take this amount of taxes, and this is my credit card bill. So that you could be thinking in your mind while you're working, which many people are thinking that. Or you could be thinking, here's what I'm doing right now. Let me just keep it simple and focus on doing what I'm doing well. And if I have any other headspace, I'll think about God. Maybe even I'll think about the fact that God is right here, right now. Maybe I'll look for opportunity to serve God right here while I'm working. But what we're really talking about is not, well, be on autopilot while you're working. That's not what we mean. We're saying, to whatever extent there's extra headspace, where are you applying it? Like, while you're working and you have extra headspace, are you preoccupied about your bills? Or are you preoccupied with how you can be useful to Hashem? That's what we're talking about. Is there any space within the concept of moving up in your career or, or aiming for success monetarily? Is there any spiritual space for that? Is there any evolution for Shem in that? Is there any spiritual space for having ambitions in your career? Yes. Yes, but you have to be very careful with it. It's a practical thing. A lot of us, especially men, that's a sexist statement, but I think it's true, attach an, 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 an inordinate amount of emotional significance to their success in the workplace. And it becomes incredibly important in their entire self-concept. And that's precisely what we're saying not to do. So is there a place for having a plan how you're going to get promoted and how you're going to grow your business or whatever? Of course, just like there's a plan for having the job that you have now, there's a plan for having a better job. But don't get so emotionally attached. That's what we're saying. Okay, let's try to finish up this chapter. Because the way that we make a living is you have to do your ishtadlis, you have to do natural, normal things. So obviously it's going to take some amount of thinking. It's going to take some amount of thinking. But it should just be what's necessary. Don't overthink it. And definitely don't take it home with you and don't stay up at night thinking about it. 
אבל לא באופן יגיע בשחקמוס ותחבולייס. It shouldn't be with hischakmos and tachbulais. I don't know how you would translate that, but like <coughs> overthinking and kniving. And, no, kniving means like, like, like nasty stuff where you're going to do something unethical. This doesn't necessarily mean, un- un- doesn't mean unethical. It means obviously crossing the line of like doing something unethical is, is wrong. But we're saying even here, like even if it's purely kosher, but it's just a lot of thinking and, you know, like Ralph Cramden. Are you guys American? <laughs> you know who Ralph Cramden was? Yeah. Yeah. I'm old and I don't get it. Is it an old Ralph Cramden <laughs> was a bus driver. His best friend worked in the sewer. He lived in a little one-room apartment in the city. And he was always coming up with these money-making schemes. How he's going to finally make it, rich. make it rich. He was obsessed with these silly money-making schemes. Okay. We know that it is Hashem's blessings that provide wealth. The job you do is just a garment, it's just a vessel or a conduit to carry the blessing. Your work is not the source of your livelihood. Big miscon- misconception. The work you do is not the source of your livelihood. The work you do is a vessel to contain the livelihood, but the livelihood is Hashem's blessing. And like we know, this is from the Tzemach Tzedek, from a mimer of the Tzemach Tzedek, that it's like clothing. That if your clothing is too big, it's not functional. If you, if you say, oh, you know what I'll do? I like this suit. You know what will make it even better? Make it ten sizes more. But now you're tripping on it. So you have to think about, I mean, the word in Hebrew is levush, which literally means clothing. But levush also means... The, the pathway of investiture, how the blessing gets, gets processed and transmitted. So a lavush doesn't just mean clothing, it means a, a conduit, it means a vessel. So just like you wouldn't say, oh, I got a great idea. If I like this suit of clothes, I'll, I know how to make it better, I'll make it bigger. But yeah, but that's not functional. Now you're going to trip on it. You're not making it better. You're actually making it you're, making it, you're turning it into an impediment. You're going to trip on it. So too, bigger is not necessarily better. So if you say, oh, I'm working this hard and I'm making this amount of money, I know what I'll do. I'll, I'll work even harder. I'll put even more of myself into it. It's not how it works. Really? Yeah, really. <laughs> you see, there are people who work very hard and never get ahead. And other people who... They fall backward into money, and somehow they have a system that works. Yeah. What? That it's only Hashem Sashkacha that decides who gets what. Just, oh, yeah, the, the hard work is not proportionate to financial success. It's totally not. We see that. We see the Schwitzers who work so hard, and they just never get ahead. It's not about hard work. Maybe not hard physical work, but maybe some people work like smarter. They just have that. Yeah, they, I, I know very smart people who, yeah, those people usually become consultants, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> the guys who have great business plans, but they never succeeded in business, they become consultants. They I promise you, because if <laughs> they needed the money, if they were succeeding in their own businesses, they wouldn't be consultants, I have to tell you. That. Okay. Vzahu dio koloshin tir de saparnosa. This is what it means, tear this upon us, a preoccupation with making a living. The Agam Shahu Bamatsa Vanomok Shieshlay Tir this upon us, Shaze Mara Asha Ene Miss Bainan Kidaboya Liba the Nafsha Shabirkas of Ayi Tashir. So even when you're in a situation where you are preoccupied about money, which the Rebbe says here means that apparently you weren't thinking clearly enough about the fact that the source of your livelihood is only Hashem's blessing, if you were clear on the fact that the source of your livelihood is only Hashem's blessing, you wouldn't be worried about working more. But since you weren't clear on that fact, 
you're thinking a lot about working more. Nevertheless, and this is the big point here, even when you're in that situation, which is an, not a good situation to be in, but even when you're in that situation, it will not extinguish the love. Now that requires explanation, because it sounds a whole lot like it does extinguish the love, or at least diminish the love. But what we're going to explain, and this is what you got to come back for, <laughs> is that even when you succumb to these preoccupations, which if you were in a more spiritual mode of thinking, you wouldn't succumb to it. But even when you do succumb to it, it's not going to take you away from Hashem. How is it not going to take me away from Hashem? It already did, it from it already did take me away from Hashem. And you're telling me it won't? We're going to explain. That's what you got to come back for. That's the cliffhanger. Yeah? So, this is, the, this is the constant conflict of the Jew, that we think that we don't care. We're like teenagers who tell our parents, yeah, we don't, we don't need you. And then we see how long we can go and before it starts gnawing away at us. But we really always do care. We always care. So we're never not. We're never not caring. We wish we could not care. Right, it would be, be much easier. Then we wouldn't come here. Then we wouldn't come here, that's right. Ha, ha, ha.